Memphis, I want to thank you for joining me today. Uh, this is the first of a full part series that the African American Studies Student Association is sponsoring along with Knights TV uh, pertaining to the history of African Americans in the country. And as we celebrate Black History Month, we wanted to start off with the topic of education and in particular how African Americans became educated in the United States. So I'm sure you know slaves were not educated. Yeah. I've heard. And our first journey here was aboard slave vessels. And so um, initially when slavery began in the United States, there was no real laws or regulations about it. But however, as time went on, they discovered that as slaves became literate and became educated, they demanded freedom or they took their freedom. Yeah. Uh, and which was the attempt of many of the slave revolts that spread across the South in the 18th century, people such as Nat Turner, demanded freedom, uh, obtained freedom at some point, but then led others to that freedom as well through a slave revolt. Uh, Denmark Vesey was a literate preacher in Charleston, South Carolina, and that resulted in a slave revolt. So they passed these laws called the Black Codes. Okay. And these were literally laws that restricted or prohibited, in the Southern states, they prohibited the formalized education of African Americans. So there was a direct link between education and slaves wanting freedom. Absolutely. They saw that as, uh, or they were fearful of that. Yes. Okay. And so in order to, to maintain the economy, they restricted the education of black slaves. But it didn't only, it wasn't only restricted to black slaves. If you were black and free, there was no education available for you. Mm -hmm. Or if you were what they called in the law at that time, mulatto, which means biracial a black parent and a white parent, um, they also were prohibited from from receiving an education. Wow, okay. So they weren't, even if they were half white, just no education at all? No so education. Okay. But over time, that began to change. So with the Second Great Awakening and that revival movement that spread across the United States, uh, Christian churches, Christian denominations, Presbyterians, Baptists, began to require some sort of Christian education for slaves. I see. And with that, uh, that, that, big, that created a weird dynamic because now you've got churches wanting slaves educated, but you've got legal systems that do not. That's a conflict, yeah. There's a big conflict there. And so what they decided was that in certain states, uh, slaves were taught the Bible, okay. taught to read the Bible, but in most states, their education was verbal only. Okay. So uh, the preachers in that area would, would teach the slaves the Bible, or if there was no preacher in the area because it was so rural, then it was up to the master to do that. And so that was what they wanted to uh, determine as a good Christian education. Mm. However, that didn't go too far because what was found is that when slaves began to receive any form of education, they learned, they yearned to learn the letter. They wanted to see it. Yeah. And so slowly but surely, people in the community began to still <laughs> educate African-Americans. Um, a lot of the children of, of slave owners who were taken to school by slaves, educated the slaves at the school with them. So people still learned to read and to write, um, whether it was known or not. Yeah. Um, people still, when I say people, I mean slaves, mm -hmm. still yearn to learn. And the progress of education for African-Americans continued to progress. Uh, I think the culminating moment, though, Memphis, yeah. was that fateful day in April 1861 in Charleston Harbor, South Carolina. Okay, what happened there? When the bullets rang and the cannon sounded off and blasted and the Civil War began. As soon as the Civil War began, things in the country changed drastically. Even before the Emancipation Proclamation, um, slaves were considered contraband of war. I see. Uh, because the North now vehemently rejected slavery and the Confederate States absolutely instilled and wanted slavery. So, slaves who could escape 
to the Union lines were considered contraband of war. No longer on those plantations, they were now in camps, uh, slave encampments throughout the border states. If well, they were contraband of war, who were they owned by? They weren't. They weren't owned. Okay. Mm -mm. Can you explain? So, what, in, in general, what that means is that the slaves were, because there was a war going on, and the war was centered around slavery and the expansion of slavery, and uh, the changing of the American economy, slaves who could escape to Union lines were protected by the Union. So in those camps, guess what happened? Teaching. The first thing they wanted to do was learn to read and write, yeah. to formally learn to read and write. And the Union was like, fully acceptable or they fully accepted them and wanted to teach them like there was no conflict well what them. the union army did was they found teachers uh, well, why so, did they want to why did they want to teach them why did they see differently well think about it a literate slave who is now free is a literate soldier yeah <laughs> I mean, there, there's a method to this madness, right? He's a literate soldier. People who can read can learn very quickly. Mm -hmm. They can take instruction, they can read instructions and act accordingly. Yeah, of course. So literate slaves were great soldiers. And we ended up with several uh, black regiments during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Prior to the Civil War, we had historically, we had black colleges. They were in Ohio Wilberforce, Lincoln, Cheney, they were all in Pennsylvania and Ohio. It was after the Civil War where a lot of philanthropists began to give money. Okay. The Uni United States supported and, a, and um, a lot of churches, African Methodist Episcopal Church in particular, began to fund the growth and establishment of formalized schools. Most of these schools would have been like high schools at okay. that point. Hampton would have been considered a high school. Um, uh, even down in Florida, Bethune, Cookman would have been considered along that line. But what happened at Hampton was really significant because Hampton grew very fast and they began to send teachers out. And one of the graduates of Hampton is a man you may know of by the name of Booker Telefero Washington. I've heard. Yeah, you heard of him? So, yeah. so Booker T. Washington is a graduate of Hampton. Uh, of Hampton. What was the education like? Like, would you think it was a high school education? Or was it something a lot less, just teaching them the basics of reading and writing? Depends. Mm -hmm. So in many of them, it was the basics. Okay. Reading, writing, arithmetic, uh, some skill development, mm -hmm. so that they could take care of themselves. Yeah. So that they can exist in a free economy. I see. Um, Hampton kind of jumped, jumped ahead quickly, though. They did the basic education, but then they began to do higher level education to train people to be teachers. Okay. Oh, okay. And so that was an, and they actually offered a degree in that. Mm -hmm. And Booker T. Washington got that degree. He acquired that degree. And then he was sent to Alabama where he founded Tuskegee Normal and Industrial Institute in the basement of Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church. So many of the, of the historically black colleges were associated with a church of some sort because that's the building they could use um, to have the school. But Booker T. founded Tuskegee on July 4th, 1881. Okay. I'm glad he did, because that's where I went. And um, he, that school quickly grew. So it started off more or less like a high school. Then it became a teacher's college. And then it became a normal and industrial institute. And that was the progression of many HBCUs, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but the economy of America was changing. We were transitioning from an agricultural, cotton-based economy to an industrial economy to compete with Great Britain. And we needed people to have these industrial skills. So schools like Hampton, Tuskegee, became these industrial uh, training grounds. Going back to when it was actually legal to teach African Americans uh, education, were those laws ever abolished? Like, did they oh, change those laws? Yes, the black codes were abolished at the end of the Civil War. But they kind of got replaced after Reconstruction with segregation laws, uh, yeah. which was very unfortunate. But um, even with those laws in place, the historically black college and university continued to progress forward. Okay, that's good. Um, so the black codes are no longer in effect. Okay. They've been abolished, but um, again, replaced with another form of oppression. 
but it didn't keep us down. We kept moving. I think what most people need to recognize is that the progression of African-American education is American progress. Because the least of us here in this country who were in the bonds of slavery have become some of the greatest people in our country. And I think that's a testament to what people can really do in America. Yeah, yeah. You know, if I, a descendant of slavery, I have, my, I have pictures of my slave relatives. If I, a descendant of slavery, can reach what I have reached and beyond, there's nothing to stop anybody. We can do it. Thank you so much, Memphis. All right, man. All right.